Hey there, folks. I'm going to talk about a not very big story. Yeah, it's not very big. Uh, a lot of the uh, Comic Gate crowd try to claim it's a huge story. Breaking! Oh my god, scandal! Um, but uh, it's, 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 it, that kind of makes me laugh a little bit, and, but it's sort of sad. So I've already like mentioned this on Twitter and stuff. Um, but there's a bunch of YouTube videos floating around, and I, I just felt like I need to rebuttal a little bit. Um, so be, brace yourself. I'm going to do that talking about politics thing again. But this is comics politics. Um, so amusingly, it seems that some of the comic age people just learned about what are called whisper networks, apparently because there's a, um, so normally fit whisper networks are very informal. And to explain what that is, you know, before there was me too and black lives matter and all that, what really happened was that minorities were the ones who got canceled. If you were uppity enough to complain about being uh, sidelined or abused or mistreated or assaulted um, or faced racism, bigotry, any of that kind of stuff. You couldn't go to HR or the police or anybody. You couldn't go to your boss. You would get told to stop making trouble and hushed up uh, and quite possibly just fired. The, the folks who got canceled were the minorities. It's why something like cancel culture, which is more of a, an abstract meme, came around. Yeah, sure, like anything, it can get out of hand, but on the whole, the, the, there is no real true culture. It's just a group of people realizing that in, in numbers we have power, and minorities and um, women and generally anyone who is disenfranchised in the past, now with the internet, can see each other and see their numbers and then act as a group. And so a number of women in comics and the related industries, um, semi-formalized, and even then I would say formalized is a stretch, but they, they formed private Facebook groups so they could communicate with each other about things that they've experienced. This is a recreation of something that's always happened. So secretary pools, people go for co coffee, and they would talk about that handsy guy in sales. I never would know to steer clear low fuck of him they would talk about the boss who's getting a promotion even though he probably raped that girl at the christmas party um word would get around and if this seems like shocking to you just understand they exist everywhere i'm a freelance illustrator freelance illustrators have bad client lists you fuck us around we keep remember your name and then when we talk to other clients or not other clients i should say other other freelancers or possibly even clients sometimes if they're friendly with them, we will sometimes bring up our experience, especially if uh, that particular name comes up. And we're like, oh, mm, careful. And, you know, if it, if it seems like a situation where we can share in confidence this information, we'll let people know what happened to us. And then the word gets around and bad clients get shunned. Uh, women, uh, uh, in terms of whisper networks, would share information about bad experiences they had, and that would help the other women know to watch out for it. Why do they call the cops? Because the cops don't help, especially don't help with uh, harassment issues. Um, it's only begun to be something vaguely a legal issue very recently. Um, likewise, when it comes to HR. And even now, most of the time, people bring up a problem. The desire for management is to sweep it under the carpet and not actually address the problem. So um, even to this day, even with Me Too, Women will still, first and foremost, check their judgment and instincts against other people's experiences. They'll, they'll go to people they confide in and trust and say, hey, look, so this happened. What do you think? Am I overreacting? What's going on? Um, and they'll get feedback probably from a number of people. On, on, I've seen these conversations, and I've had f women, friend talk, women friends talk in front of me about these experiences. And you'll they'll get responses that range from, yeah, you maybe are overreacting to, no, I don't think you are, to, oh, yeah, I know that guy. It happened to me, too. And that's what a whisper network is. That's all it is. It's all it is. It's not some grand freaking Masonic conspiracy. So, yes, some of them joined a Facebook group. And, yes, they have taken to comparing notes and talking about it. And when one of them says, you know, I'm thinking about going public with this now that Me Too's here and I feel like there's some safety in or at least, uh, not even necessarily safety, but um, I see the benefit of airing this sort of stuff so that people don't think they can get away with it. And they will 
get encouraged or based on the situation, I'm sure some of them are set, are told, you know, we don't know enough and there isn't enough to back it up. Maybe we shouldn't yet, but, you know, they'll start collecting information and they'll ask around and see if anyone has some experiences. And yeah, if, if, if uh, someone ha if multiple people have experiences with one bad actor, they'll coordinate, they'll organize and say, look, let's agree all to do a thing at one time. That's not an evil conspiracy and it's not playing dirty i heard saw one i didn't watch the whole youtube thing i can't watch any of these things at full length they're ridiculous but the i saw one clip where the guy was talking about at the beginning you know at the end of the day we would just go tell them their face that we don't like them punch them do you have any idea how retrograde that is uh i would rather someone just tell me sure but when you wield more power socially people can't just tell you you get silenced and the point here isn't necessarily about stopping you for the thing you did it's about airing the fact that this stuff happens and this person here who's waving uh, uh using influence to try to accomplish something it has compromised their credibility and has misused their influence in other situations you know this is this is a question of free speech and expression but also self-preservation and protecting others uh other peers that recent harper's letter uh i dislike it i actually had an interesting email exchange with noam chomsky you can write academics pretty easily uh it's not, it's not, that's not too surprising what's surprising is he responded and it was civil i was respectful i like a lot of what noam has to say um but i disagree with him at times uh and in this one pretty strongly um, not like an aggressive disagreement, but I just, I don't agree with what he was saying at all in his letters. Um, not to get too much into it. They were somewhat private, but mostly he just doesn't see that this is people of privilege complaining about their privilege being challenged. But this is my problem with the Harper's letter. It's a bunch of people essentially complaining about the 911 caller when the cops show up and shoot the person rather than ask questions on a wellness check. The 911 caller, the person raising the alarm, isn't the problem. If you're concerned, as the Harper's letter says, that institutions are reacting uh, heavy handedly or that people are losing their jobs, um, you know, my going on Twitter and saying this person should be fired can't get them fired. I don't, I'm not the boss, I'm not the head of HR. But if what I raise their attention to does actually qualify something that would be a firing offense on HR policy, then the institution can make that choice if i make so much stink out of the large group of us if the i is many and we raise a lot of fuss uh, on twitter or social media about bad behavior or a terrible pattern of conduct and someone well if the recent case where the editor didn't get fired as the uh, harper's article suggested but quit because all of his black staff uh, got together and said, you know what, we have a real problem with you bringing on a conservative, I think it was a senator or congressman, say, encouraging uh, the police to use violence and just like shoot protesters and stuff. Uh, the, the, the journalists had a very good point. They're out there reporting. They would be caught in the crossfire. That editorial decision to post, run that editorial piece actually put their lives in danger. And the editor wasn't fired. He quit. Um, he faced a staff uprising and a challenge to his credibility, and he resigned. I don't know if that's because he recognized there was a problem with what he did or that he was sulking. It doesn't really matter. He wasn't fired. He made his own choices. Um, my quibble with what Gnome's, Gnome's take is that he were giving the right fodder. It's like, bullshit. Anything you do to be self-aware and critical is, is technically be argued as fodder for the other side, but when the left analyzes and calls on bad actors within the left uh, for their behavior, that's not helping the right. That's making sure that we have our house in order. Um, the right not doing that is how we end up with Trump. So this is nothing to brag about. I've seen this in the States, the American politics all the time. We're like, you know, the Americans, the right Republicans, they... They know, they know how to win fights. They just you know, lock together and unity in numbers. Blah, blah. Yes, but when they do it with a complete, uh, ignore, completely ignoring any kind of ethical or, or philosophical co consistency and are willing to do anything for the prize, well, they're not exactly something to admire. Um, 
there are problems. Nothing is perfect. And when people get uh, dogmatic, yeah, sure, that is an issue. But um, call-out culture, which is really consequence culture, is just a question of people calling for consequences. And that's not bad. And whisper networks becoming more public and sharing what they know, that's not bad either. Granted, just about, again, any of these systems could go awry. It could uh, target someone incorrectly because of bad information. It's always possible. One of the best outcomes is that whisper networks get big because the larger the pool of information, the more fact-checking and inherently built into that, the more cross-referencing. And if you hear about someone doing something bad once, the general philosophy is, well, that doesn't, isn't good, but let's just keep an eye on that because we don't know enough yet. I'm not saying everyone does that, but I know that this is a general policy when you're talking about that kind of word of mouth uh, information. If I have a bad client and I go talk to my illustrator friends and no one's ever had a bad problem with them, in fact, some have had good, good experiences with them, they're not going to meet. They go, oh, well, that person's in the, on, the, on the shit list. You know, they're going to go, oh, that's unfortunate. And they'll file it away for future reference. And then if a pattern emerges, then something might happen. All of the stories about people getting uh, in trouble for their actions it's usually pattern based. It isn't because one thing happens. Some sure, some people have been called out for one thing, but it doesn't mean that they suddenly lost their job. And un, c contrary to what you see with that Harper's letter, the reality is most people don't get lose their jobs or or get fired or get run out of dodge or silenced on, on academia. Most of these people that have been called out keep their jobs or whatever. A minority who are just unquestionably in the wrong, a lot of them have resigned. A few of them have been let go. Um, that's not a bad thing because they were in the wrong. They're the wrong people for those jobs. I think in the end, this idea that Comicsgate has stumbled into, which is not new, of there being a whisper network, they're trying to paint it as a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. Yes, technically you could say that they are conspiring when they discuss things privately amongst themselves. But to pre pretend that that is some sort of evil... Mm, pulling the strings and per portraying the people that are getting called out for legitimate bad conduct as somehow victims or that it's somehow fair or that we're, you know, oh, how could you? You're taking food off their children's tables. I'm sorry, did they suddenly become unable to go do work of some kind? I mean, yes, you might have a harder time selling comics to Marvel or DC if they decide you're you're just too much of a controversial figure. But it doesn't mean you can't feed your kids. And let's be clear, very few people are doing that from comics. And if they are, well, lucky them, that is a privilege. And if you're abusing your privileged position to fuck with people and you lose that privilege, mm, tiny violins. Uh, as someone who's struggled for 30 years and succeeded to a limited extent to be a freelance artist who makes a living from my art, I gotta assure you, none of this is guaranteed. Even me making these videos on YouTube. Theoretically, I put my income at risk. Uh, I would be rather put it at risk and live in the world with a free conscience and speak my mind. And I'm sure those on the far right think the same thing when they go on and vent about secret conspiracies out to get them all. But uh, the people who are organizing through whisper networks, communities, that's the other word for it, but like quietly, um, and then deciding as a group that they're going to collectively speak out, they're doing nothing different. They're not some cabal out to get you. They're not being manipulative. They're not being evil. They're using what power they do have to protect themselves and look out for others and let people know that this is not a perfect industry. The first time I mentioned this, I believe, uh, in a video commenting on the Warren Ellis and Cameron Stewart stuff, the first time I became aware that there was a sexist abuse of power in comics, it wasn't the first time I was aware that those were things in the world. It was more of a, oh, that happens in comics too, of course. And that was in the early 90s. Um, and that wasn't the first big news about it. It was just my first encounter with it. None of this is new. What's changing is that the people who are usually disenfranchised were the victims, the women or people of color who faced uh, racism or 
uh, isolation and blacklisting because they dared to say this this isn't cool you can't harass me at work or you shouldn't do that thing um now because they can speak with a collective voice they're starting to actually have some power at the table and if someone is repeatedly a bad actor yeah the whisper network is going to share information it's not a network but whisper networks plural are going to share information people will pass it around and if they realize that there's enough of this from one person they're going to have the confidence to say you know what buddy no more and call you on your crap and that's good that's progress you might not like it if you're the target of it but maybe you shouldn't have done those things that are getting you called out so that's what i think of that it's not a big news story it is really isn't it's not a big scandal it's just uh, the long, slow process of justice coming around to bite you in the ass.